It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you so, uh, thank you so much, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier, uh, and it's a question that has to do with what looks like it's becoming the weekly billion-dollar boondoggle. First, it was the billion-dollar boondoggle and the handover of a uh, billion dollars to the corporation that runs the 407. Now it's a billion-dollar boondoggle uh, when it comes to COVID-19 funds that went to businesses that were not eligible. Uh, some of them weren't even reporting any COVID uh, losses whatsoever. The auditor uh, said, and I quote, the government did not make any attempts to recover funds paid to ineligible recipients. Meanwhile, hard-hit businesses that needed the money were literally boarding up their windows. So my question to the Premier is, why is the Premier doing nothing, nothing at all, to get these funds back from the poorly planned program that he personally launched? And to reply to the government, the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker, and I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, when we were in a massive crisis, a massive crisis, companies were ready to close their doors, we saved 120,000 businesses. And even if you multiply and being conservative, five people per business, that's 600,000 businesses. And guess what, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition voted against it, voted against the $3.4 billion to support the businesses, voted against 600,000 families that needed that support. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you what that did. Mr. Speaker, it created another 47, 45,000 jobs because we lost 1.1 million jobs. Now we're above that. We've created 45,000 more jobs. Question. Well, Speaker, the Premier's priority, we will all recall, was big box stores over small businesses. A year ago, as he uh, usually does, he boasted about this program that the auditor literally describes as troubling because absolutely nobody, absolutely no one was watching the funds. Out of province businesses actually received Ontario cash. The accuracy of the financial information that was submitted was literally not even checked, Speaker. Premier Ford shoveled this money out the door in two days of putting together a back-of-the-napkin plan after dragging his feet for 10 months while businesses were going under. But with no questions asked whatsoever, that money flew out the door. How could the Premier hand out literally a billion dollars without any accountability whatsoever while struggling businesses lost everything and shut their doors? And the Premier will respond. The Leader of the Opposition is saying struggling businesses. She didn't care about the businesses. She voted no. If it was up to the Leader of the Opposition, she wouldn't give a red cent. And what the Auditor General reported is not 100 per cent accurate, Mr. Speaker. What it is, it's a, time in, it's, a, it's a time that one month they took, it was one month, and you're telling me businesses only lost money for one month? They, they lost it throughout the whole pandemic. So again, Mr. Speaker, with a snapshot in time of $225 million, are we going after bad actors? We'll go after bad actors. 100 per cent we're going to go after them. But, for the Leader of the Opposition to sit there and criticize when she was against 120,000 businesses and wouldn't give them one red cent, we would be short 120,000 businesses if it was up to the Leader of the Opposition. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it is a $1 billion tax dollar boondoggle, as a matter of fact, and that's bad enough. But the auditor says, contrary to what the Premier just claimed, that it's not going after the money. The Premier is not going after the money, is what the report says. 14,500 ineligible businesses received funds. And I quote the Auditor General when she, her report says, the government did not attempt to recover these amounts and subsequently wrote them off as uncollectible in August, just a couple of months ago. A billion dollars was wasted that could have gone to struggling small businesses. Instead, they closed. Nursing shortages that are 
really causing trouble right now in our health care system. Instead, we're still 20,000 years is short. Smaller class sizes Order. that could have protected our kids. Instead, the cupboard was bare. When was the Premier briefed about this billion-dollar boondoggle, and when did he sit, decide not to do a single thing? Thank you. Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's, it's really disturbing when the Auditor General does just a snapshot of one month, April. Doesn't do the 20 months, but does one single month that, again, the opposition didn't give two hoots about the small businesses. They didn't care if they went bankrupt. They didn't care if 600,000 people lost their jobs. We're a government that cares for small business. We take care of the, the little guy, a little Order. gal running a business, working their back off. They did not even support the $3.4 billion, did not support the 120,000 businesses. They would leave them out on the street starving if it was up to the leader of the opposition. I'll tell you, our government's not going to let anyone Order. starve. We're going to support them. And I asked the Auditor General to make make herself a lot more accurate and, and not as uh, what she what she mentioned. The House will come to order. Next question. Once again, the leader of the opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next uh, question is also to the Premier. Speaker, we all know that over 10,000 folks lost their lives uh, tragically to this pandemic. Every one of them was a person who was loved. Many of them lost. Uh, left this world rather uh, completely alone without family, uh, traumatizing loved ones and caregivers alike. Uh, frontline workers gave their all, some even their lives. Our healthcare heroes didn't have access to the PPP, PPE they needed and risked their lives. Thousands of small businesses, uh, business owners had to walk away from their dreams. Speaker, the responsible thing to do is to make sure that this never happens again. So my question to the Premier is, when will the Premier be reviewing how Ontario handled this pandemic to ensure we are prepared and that this never does happen again? Reply for the government, the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I actually appreciate the question from uh, from the member opposite. Uh, uh, we started actually during the pandemic. We were one of the first governments that actually undertook a, a review of, uh, of the long term uh, of the long term care system. And during the pandemic, we have been standing up organizations to help us deal with some of the shortcomings that we saw. In her question, she talked about uh, the inadequacy of uh, PPE during the, the initial stages, and, and we saw in other jurisdictions what they were doing and how they were doing it better. That is why the Minister of uh, Government and Consumer Services has standed up, is standing up a new organization to ensure that we have access uh, to PPE. That's why uh, the Minister of Economic Development uh, uh, in, ensured that there were home-based home, uh, uh, resources to access uh, PPE. That's why the Minister of, of Education learned in the early stages of some of the things that we needed to do to ensure that our students could return to, uh, to school safely, including uh, leading uh, the country with respect to, uh, uh, to ventilation. The Minister of Health, of course, increased uh, uh, testing capacity from 5,000 to 100,000, Mr. Speaker. So we have been learning the entire time. The pandemic is not over. There's still more work to do. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. What we need to do is ensure that the best interests of people and their safety always comes first. We have to ensure that we always have an adequate PPE stockpile. We have to ensure that small businesses are supported and protected from the very beginning. We need to ensure that uh, our classrooms are uh, someplace where kids can still go safely and not be out of school for inordinate amounts of time. We need to ensure Speaker, frankly, that this never happens again. Now, we know that the Liberals had the SARS Commission, and we clearly didn't learn what we should have from it. The government must learn from the mistakes and the things that went well. Ontarians deserve that kind of accountability, Speaker. So my question is, when will the Premier launch an open and public trans and a transparent review of how Ontario handled the pandemic? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, look, obviously there are going to be lessons to be learned from uh, uh, from uh, how the, the government uh, uh, held uh, or dealt with the pandemic. Uh, I do agree with the leader of the opposition. Uh, there was the SARS uh, the SARS report, and the previous uh, Liberal government did absolutely nothing to learn from the lessons of SARS. That is why we were faced with uh, PPE short uh, shortfalls. That is why we had a testing capacity of only 5,000. Uh, uh, tests per day. That is why we had an ICU capacity where 800 people in ICU.
ICU in the province of Ontario, one of the wealthiest jurisdictions in North America, was brought to its knees longer than any other jurisdiction because the previous Liberal government failed to make the investments in ICU capacity, they failed to make the investments in critical care capacity, they failed to make the investments in education, they failed to make the investments in long-term care, Mr. Speaker. So there is a lot to learn. There is a lot to learn. I hear the member from Ottawa South upset because he was a parliamentary assistant in that government that failed the people of Ontario so badly, Mr. Speaker. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, that's a very disappointing response from the government House Leader because this is not a partisan issue. Ontarians know how hard this was and how hard it still is. We can and must learn from it, all of us. We can and must do better. That's what Ontarians deserve. We have to be ready for anything else that's coming our way. The UK promised a public inquiry last May. The federal government says a review is warranted. Any responsible government will call a public inquiry into the pandemic and how it was handled so that the lessons can be learned this time. That's what Ontarians deserve. Will the Premier Therefore, do the responsible thing and commit to calling a full, independent public inquiry into how the COVID-19 pandemic was handled here in our province of Ontario. Again, Mr. Speaker, I can appreciate that the member opposite doesn't want to talk uh, about the failings of, uh, of the previous Liberal government, but I think it is important, uh, Mr. Speaker. There was Order. a time, of course, when the Leader of the Opposition worked hand-in-hand -hand with the Liberal Party and helped facilitate the failings that we had. Order. But I will say this, Mr. Speaker, obviously it is very important that we look at the lessons from COVID. What happened? Uh, there were a number of short uh, shortcomings with respect to PPE supply. There were a number of shortcomings with respect to ICU capacity. There were shortcomings with respect to uh, infection prevention and control measures. There were shortcomings on the, in, the, in the school system. But these are things that we knew about as we came to office in 2018. That's why the Premier had a focus on rebuilding the province of Ontario from the ground up, Mr. Speaker. More hospitals, 30,000 long-term care beds, expanding ICU capacity, reopening some of the 600 schools that were closed by the previous Liberal government. Are there lessons to be learned? Obviously there are, but once we are out of the pandemic, then we can start to learn those lessons, not in the middle of it. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, a new report from the Auditor General shows that the Ford government has made almost no progress on the recommendations uh, to improve long-term care. To make matters worse, Speaker, the Auditor General's report also shows that the meals uh, being offered to residents don't even contain enough nutri nutrients to keep people healthy. We all read the horrific stories from the Canadian Armed Forces report of how m residents in long-term care were being forced fed um, and that the meals had too much sugar, too much salt, not enough fiber. But the government isn't doing a thing to improve the conditions for Ontarians and loved ones in long-term care. When will the ministry take the long overdue steps needed to guarantee that residents in long-term care homes are provided safe, and appropriate meals in accordance with their plans of care. Government House Leader. Well, well Speaker, uh, the member will know that, of course, there is very important legislation in front of this House right now with respect to improving conditions in our long-term care homes, which includes uh, a, a focus on, uh, on inspections, Mr. Speaker, which includes ground, groundbreaking uh, uh, North American leading uh, standards of care. Four hours of care, Mr. Speaker, is something that has been talked about for years. It is something that this government is finally delivering on, Mr. Speaker. But in order for us to do that, we have to hire 27,000 additional uh, PSWs, which we're doing right now. We're working, of course, with uh, our community colleges to ensure that we can uh, uh, bring on these 27,000. That's why we're hiring uh, uh, 2,000 uh, new nurses, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, also, we have to build that capacity. I talked about this a little bit yesterday, that we were housing seniors in, in our acute care system, in our hospitals, Mr. Mr. Speaker. That's completely inappropriate. That is why before the election, we knew that we had to rebuild long-term care, and it starts with uh, 27 or 30,000 additional beds. There is not one community across this province that won't have access to a new state-of-the-art long-term care facility with 27,000 additional PSWs to ensure that our seniors get the. Thank you. Supplementary question. 
Um, speaker, with all due respect to the government House Leader, it's one thing to hire PSWs. It's another thing to pay them fairly for the work that they do with a permanent pandemic pay. Speaker, the government can try to blame the pandemic for their failures to act on the Auditor General's past recommendations as well. But while they were sitting on their hands, nonprofit leaders like Advantage Ontario quickly stepped up to make sure their member organizations made progress towards targets outlined in the Auditor General's report. For example, Advantage Ontario delivered four webinars related to food and nutrition and offered their members strategies to help direct care, staff access, and implement resident care plans. Speaker, advocacy groups shouldn't be left up to uh, left alone to implement all of the recommendations from the Auditor General's uh, report. It's actually the ministry's job to do that. When will the ministry take these reports seriously, Question. help long-term care homes build the capacity they need, and improve conditions for vulnerable residents in long-term care? Well, Mr. Speaker, we started working on that from day one. In fact, before we were even elected, we highlighted the need to improve long-term care, Mr. Speaker. We highlighted the need to work on hallway health care, Mr. Speaker, and we are doing that by hiring tw uh, 27,000 additional PSWs, by building 30,000 new long-term care beds. But it is more than that, Mr. Speaker. It is about the Ontario health teams that the Minister of Health is bringing in. It is about world-class leading investments, billions of dollars for a new Ottawa hospital, and just Yesterday, in the members' own region of Peel, one of the largest investments in health care in Canadian history. In Canadian history. Now, Mr. Speaker, you will know, as I've said on a number of occasions, our two members from Brampton have been working extraordinarily hard to improve health care in their own community by bringing a new hospital for the people of Brampton, and I congratulate those two members. Disappointed that the member opposite and the rest of her colleagues voted against all of these investments, Mr. Speaker, but we'll get the job done. The next question, the member for Scarborough, Rouge Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Speaker, as we all know, Ontario benefits from a remarkable diversity. It is truly one of our province's great strengths. Diversity has been shown to increase innovation, reduce risk, and open new opportunities for economic development and growth. However, there are people in our province who are impacted by systematic barriers that limit their potential, limit their employment potential. And that is why addressing these barriers is not just the right thing to do. It is good for jobs and it's good for businesses. So, Speaker, can the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism Please tell this House what is our government doing to make Ontario more inclusive for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To reply, the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Scarborough Rouge River for the question and also for his hard work on behalf of his constituents. It's always an honour and a privilege to rise in this House and to speak about the tremendous work our government is doing under the leadership of our Premier, Mr. Speaker, to build a stronger and more inclusive province for everyone. By investing an additional over $8 million in a recent fall economic statement, our government continues our commitment to working with our community partners to bring real programs that deliver real change, Mr. Speaker. As a former small business owner myself, I know firsthand the challenges that some of our black, indigenous, and other racialized communities face when trying to find work or to start a small business, Mr. Speaker, to support their families. Response? This government will continue to fight for equal op opportunities for all of us in our province of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for his answer. I'm pleased to know about the remarkable progress our government is making for the people of Ontario. These actions are an important step forward for building even more inclusive province for everyone. As our government focuses on recovery, we know that addressing systematic and complex issues like discrimination and intolerance is critical to Ontario's economic success. Speaker, through you to the Honourable Minister, what is this government doing to ensure that our recovery includes all Ontarians from all walks of life? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, my colleague for that important question again, Mr. Speaker. Our government is absolutely committed to identifying and taking immediate action to addressing anything. 
that might li limit someone's potential in this province. That is why we said yes to $1.6 million for Business Resource Hub to help employers diversify their workforce, Mr. Speaker. And we said yes to $5 million in business grant to help racialize entrepreneurs start or grow their business, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank, of course, the Premier, the Minister of Finance, and all of my colleagues for working with me to build these programs that will go to help ensure greater economic inclusion and build an even stronger province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Uh, thank you, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. For three years, Vibert, who can no longer speak, has been a resident at Cheltenham Care Community, a for-profit long-term care home operated by Siena Senior Living. On October 2nd, Pamela Britton noticed that her 74-year-old brother, Vibert, had developed a bed sore on his side. On November 5th, more than a month after Pamela discovered it, Vibert's wounds got so bad that Pamela could smell rot through his bandages. Fearing for her brother's life, Pamela had to fight the home to have him taken to hospital, with the home telling paramedics that it was a non-emergency. Vibert had gone septic. When he was first admitted to hospital, he was put on 17 IV bags of antibiotics a day. The doctor at North York General told Pamela that if Vibert had gotten to the hospital any later, he would have died. I'm asking a page to deliver this envelope to the Premier. Within it is the horrifying image of the gaping wound, larger than a fist that Vibert has endured while unable to speak. This image is an embodiment of all the wasted time to fix long-term care in Ontario while so many are there right now suffering in pain and on death's door. Premier, after all that has happened now, how can this still be allowed to happen on, in Ontario? To reply to the government. To Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, uh, not knowing uh, the case, and I appreciate the, the honourable gentleman for bringing that forward. Obviously, this uh, uh, an incident like this uh, has no place in the province of Ontario. We are one of the richest jurisdictions in North America, Mr. Speaker. Despite the challenges that we have faced during COVID, Mr. Speaker, there is no excuse for people not being treated properly, both in our health care system and in our long-term care system, Mr. Speaker. That is why we are making the immediate investments to increase care to four hours a day, to bring on 27,000 new additional PSWs, to bring on 30,000 new long-term care beds in all parts of the province, Mr. Speaker. We knew that this was an issue before we came to office. I suspect all members knew that this was an issue before they came to office. As we were campaigning, we heard it when we went door to door that something had to be done with long-term care. Now, Mr. Speaker, before we leave this place, the members opposite will have an opportunity to help build on that by voting in favour of a bill that we brought forward to improve long-term care for generations to come, and I hope that they will do that. Yeah. Question. Thank you, Speaker. Fast forward to today. Thankfully, the hospital saved his life. But nearly a month after he was first admitted, Vibert is still in the hospital and receiving six bags of antibiotics a day to treat his infection. Now, Pamela, his sister, said that the hospital has told her that Vibert must go back to the private long-term care home so he doesn't lose his spot at Cheltenham. Pamela told me that she does not want him to go back there, and she is worried that if he does, he might not survive. Premier, what will you do right now to help this family in desperate need? I remind the members to make the comments to the chair. Government House Leader to reply. Again, obviously, uh, Mr. Speaker, I've not spoken, and I'm, I'm, I'm unsure if the, I doubt that the minister, he's spoken with the minister in, in advance of this, but I appreciate that he would, uh, he would bring this, uh, this question forward. It's an important thing uh, for, uh, an important question. I think it has its place in question period because it does highlight the challenges that we are facing in long-term care. We have never said that long-term care shouldn't be a priority in the province of Ontario. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we have been disappointed that for far too long, long care, long-term care was not a priority of the four previous Liberal administrations, Mr. Speaker. They had four different administrations over 15 years to help us move into a better direction Order. on long-term care. It is no secret that our population was aging, Mr. Speaker. That is why we are moving so aggressively. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing is bringing forward MZOs to ensure Spons. that we can build new long-term care beds. They're against that, Mr. Speaker. They're against 27,000 additional PSWs. They're against all of the investments that we're making to improve the system, but he has an opportunity to vote in favour of the new bill. Thank you. The next question, the member for Durham. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. As stated in the throne speech for this parliamentary session, the pandemic has exposed the failure of successive governments, both provincial and federal, to provide adequate funding to our hospitals. 
The clear consequence was a health system ill-equipped to handle a crisis. Not only do we need to continue to do short-term planning for surge capacity through the winter, but also continue to build our long-term health care capacity. The minister has recently announced moving forward with a number of expansions in Peel region. My question is, when will the Bowmanville Hospital expansion move to the next stage of approvals? By the Minister of Health. Speaker, and thank you very much to the member opposite for the question. I am very pleased to provide an update on the Lake Ridge Health's redevelopment project at its Bowmanville site. Lake Ridge Health's redevelopment project in Bowmanville aims to renew infrastructure and expand facilities for programs and services such as the emergency department, inpatient units, diagnostic imaging, and some ambulatory services and support services. The project is included in the government's multi-year infrastructure investment plan and is currently in the early stages of the Ministry of Health's capital planning project. The ministry is continuing to work closely with the hospital to advance this project through planning to implementation. Our government is committed to making investments in the health system based on system needs and priorities, as well as sound fiscal planning and ensuring Response. these investments are carried out efficiently. Thank you. That's your question. Thank you, Speaker. The previous government didn't do much beyond sign off on a news release on this project. I'm thankful for the money the Ministry of Health has put on the table during my term to support the expansion in the form of a planning grant, as well as financial support to create a new temporary helipad at a safe location for the course of the redevelopment. The hospital is eager to move to the next stage of the planning process and get this project closer to construction. The minister has shown more support uh, than any other minister for this project. Will she be the minister that is more than talk? and takes action to get this expansion built. Minister of Health. Well, thank you again for the question, and I am pleased to say that as part of Lake Ridge Health's major redevelopment project at their Bowmanville site, that the interim helipad relocation project has been approved. Yeah. This involves the construction of a helipad at a site made available to the hospital through a leasing arrangement with the municipality of Clarington in Durham Region. The use of an interim helipad, once completed, will enable Orange and the hospital to resume the transfer of critical patients to or from the Bowmanville site where required via air ambulance and ensure patient safety and operational efficiency while the Bowmanville site is being redeveloped. Our government will continue to invest in hospital capital projects to ensure that our hospitals can keep pace with patient needs and increase access to high quality Response. care for patients and families across Ontario. Thank you. Next question, the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Service. And I want to commend and thank her for the stellar job she's doing in this very important ministry and the people of Kanata Carleton. There's a growing demand for services for children and youth with special needs. When children in Ontario begin school, almost 30 per cent that could pose a risk to their lifelong health, learning, and behavior. Due to this, there's great need for support for children and youth with special needs. Mr. Speaker, last year, over 110,000 children and youth received rehabilitation services, including occupational therapy, physiotherapy, and speech-language pathology, pathology through children's treatment centers and community-based settings across Ontario. So my question through you, Speaker, to the Honourable Minister is what is our government doing to make it easier for children with special needs to gain access to the care they require? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member uh, from Bruce Gray Owen Sound uh, for such an important uh, contribution to his constituents and for that uh, uh, very important question. Our government recognizes the importance of accessibility to services, and I hear the needs of families who have children with special needs in my hometown of Ottawa. And that's why this government is increasing accessibility by investing in a new integrated treatment centre at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, a paediatric health and research centre in Ottawa. The new multi-storey building called One Door for Care will reduce the need for families to travel to multiple facilities to gain access to important treatment and rehabilitation services, such as occupational therapy, physiotherapy, speech and language pathology and autism services. We promise to support children with special 
special needs. Response. And the One Door for Care Treatment Centre delivers on that promise. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services for her answer and her work. The government recently announced an additional $240 million in funding over four years to reduce wait lists and build additional service capacity for early intervention and rehabilitation services for children and youth with special needs. This government's actions are addressing the critical needs of children and youth with special needs. Such support for children with special needs and actions like this investment sets up these children to have the best outcomes for their health and happiness. So, Speaker, through you, my question for the minister is, can the minister please elaborate on the benefits and services this new treatment centre will provide? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, once again, thank you to the member for the question. Uh, for children with multiple or complex special needs, One Door for Care will bring together teams of professionals under one roof to support children with special needs through a coordinated plan of care. CHEO currently provides these services in eight locations across the region, which can make it difficult for families and providers to coordinate services and to support children and youth as they grow into adulthood. So we're making special needs supports more accessible with One Door for Care. One Door for Care will help reduce wait times for services so more children and youth can receive services on an annual basis, address capacity issues so there is more space available for service delivery, and bring together teams of professionals working together under one roof to support children's special needs. Thank you, Speaker. Excellent. Next question, member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, tomorrow marks the International Day for Persons with Disabilities. It's a time to celebrate the contribution that people with disabilities and the disability rights movement have made to this province. But there is a painful sadness this year. For the first time, in a letter to the leaders of Ontario's political parties, the AODA Alliance has acknowledged with frustration that the Ontario government will fail to meet its obligation to ensure that Ontario becomes fully accessible to the 2.6 million Ontarians with disabilities by 2025, which is what the statute here requires. This is due to years of stalling and broken promises by Liberal and Conservative governments since the Legislature unanimously passed the AODA in 2005. So my question to the Premier Speaker through you. Will this government lay out what specific steps this government is prepared to take question. during its last remaining months in office to fulfil its duty to make Ontario accessible to people with disabilities? To reply to the government, the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate the, the question from uh, from the member opposite, and uh, I know that he uh, uh, has been a, a very uh, powerful critic in the role, and also uh, uh, in many instances uh, uh, a. a uh, a partner with uh, with uh, the minister and helping him understand uh, uh, issues uh, of importance uh, to the to the community, Mr. Speaker. Look, I, I, I acknowledge that there is still a lot of work that uh, that needs to be done uh, uh, across the province of Ontario, and uh, and we are continuing to work on that. There are a number of reports that have highlighted uh, highlighted that, Mr. Speaker, and both uh, uh, both I would suggest federally and provincially and with our municipal partners. So. Uh, look, there's a lot of work that has to be done. I, I suspect that it's something that we will uh, begin to focus on right here at home in our own uh, legislature over the next uh, uh, little while, uh, uh, Speaker. But uh, I don't want to uh, uh, give the member uh, an answer uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, doesn't befit how important this issue is. Uh, it is very important to the minister. It is something that we are working on, and I do appreciate the urgency of it. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate that answer, but acknowledging that we're falling short on accessibility for 2.6 million people in this province and that we won't hit the target we're required to hit by 2025, I'm just going to say to this government, to any government that comes after, that doesn't mean we shrug our shoulders and give up. This acknowledgement that the AODA Alliance has made does not mean we can't stop pursuing vigorously the things we need to pursue. What we have seen since the Honourable David Onley has given this government a report a thousand days ago, Speaker, more than a thousand days ago, and in this report, Mr. Onley describes soul crushing barriers facing people with disabilities in Ontario in health care, in school, in employment, in their usage of public space. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, Speaker. Mr. Onley and people before him have shown us the way. What we need is a plan in the last six months of this parliament. I've risen in this space, as the House Leader mentioned. Question. I've offered my own plan. My question is, will you embrace it, or will you propose your own? Because that would, that's what people with disabilities and their families want, and we need an answer. 
Uh, yeah, you know, Mr. Speaker, I, again, I do, I do appreciate that. Uh, uh, we have started, obviously, with, uh, with aging in place and ensuring that uh, at home people can uh, make uh, retrofits to their own homes that will allow uh, uh, persons with disabilities or persons who need uh, assistance at home can make the retrofits at home so we can start there, uh, Speaker. I know that uh, uh, the uh, uh, Minister in charge of, uh, of, of the Trillium Foundation is also ensuring that there are significant investments that uh, uh, that go to community organizations across the across the province. And the minister responsible for seniors and disability is also a number of programs uh, to help kickstart in a number of ways uh, this very important work. Uh, uh, but as I said, look, I acknowledge there is more work to be done. Uh, many of the new long-term cares, obviously all of the new long-term care homes that we are bringing uh, into the province are going to be completely uh, uh, accessible, are going to Response. have all of the features that you would have expected many years, many years ago. I acknowledge there is more work to be done. The only report uh, highlighted it. Our minister responsible is, is getting that work done, and, uh, and I'm sure we'll have more to say very soon. Next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Auditor General revealed that this government sent almost $1 billion to businesses that weren't eligible for the small business grant or were given more than their losses warranted. She found a troubling absence of controls that resulted in the approval of suspicious applications, including from businesses with addresses outside Ontario. Mr. Speaker, this government is basically a terrible version of Oprah and with taxpayer money. You get the grant. You get the grant. Outside of Ontario, you get a grant as well. You're not eligible, whatever. You get the grant anyway. Everybody gets a grant. Oh, but you in the back, in sectors that we singled out at the outset, you obviously don't get a grant. Too bad. We get to decide which ineligible business gets the grant. Mr. Speaker, this is unacceptable. When will this government stop making gaffe after gaffe after gaffe yep. that is costing hardworking Ontario taxpayers billions of dollars? The Minister of Finance to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and through you to the member opposite uh, for that question. You know what's unacceptable is the premise of that question, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Does the member opposite not think that supporting small businesses in this province is the right thing to do? Does the, the member opposite not realize that the Auditor General is talking about a point in time that businesses have suffered for over 21 months and that since the beginning of this pandemic that we have supported small businesses starting in March of 2020 when we launched $19 billion action plan? Mr. Speaker, I don't think the member opposite would want to go to those small businesses and say, you've struggled, you've had hardships, and we want your money back. They applied in good faith. They're hard-working people of this province, and this Premier and this government will continue to support the small businesses and their families in this province. Any supplementary question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Premier is saying that the problems in the small business grant were because he rushed so quickly to get the funds out the door. Well, well, the program was launched in January 2021, 10 months after the pandemic began. 10 months, Mr. Speaker. What's more, the Premier said, and I quote, unfortunately, you're going to see some fraud. Now shifting the blame onto businesses when actually it was their system who couldn't even filter out businesses that don't qualify or that aren't even in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, this government has betrayed Ontarians, betrayed our trust, betrayed our confidence in this administration. Almost at the end of their mandate, is it even worth asking the question, when will the Premier get a functional administration? Huh. Mr. Finance. I don't know where to start with that question. The problem with the, uh, the, the, the problem with the Order. member opposite is that uh, maybe the little lapse of memory from all the members in terms of this government in March of 2020, billion and billion dollars of rent relief for small businesses, billions in WSIB premium relief, billion dollars in tax deferrals and cash flow deferrals in March of 2020, and we continued that Order. program. So are you going to go to those small businesses, many of the ones that I've met in my riding of Pickering Oxbridge, who said that this small business grant? Okay. The opposition has to come to order. Apologize to the Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Many of those small businesses who said the difference between our supporting them in their time of need was the difference between keep keeping the lights on and turning them off for good, Mr. Speaker. This government will support those families and those small businesses in all our main streets in Ontario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The next question, the member for Halliburton, Fourth and Lakes Broad. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, after 15 years of Liberal government in Ontario, life got harder for people living in Northern Ontario. 
The previous Liberal government failed on winter road maintenance, they cancelled passenger rail, and they failed to make meaningful targeted highway investments the region so desperately needs. Ontarians are counting on this government to be different when it comes to the north. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister of Transportation. Please tell us what the government is doing to make up for over a decade of neglect and deliver much needed transportation to support the North. Sir Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you so much to the member from Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, for the question. I was very pleased to be in Thunder Bay earlier this week to announce an investment of $171 million to refurbish 94 Go Transit bi-level coaches at the Alstom plant located in Thunder Bay. Speaker, this is a deal that's good for transit and good for the hardworking people of Thunder Bay. These refurbishments, on top of our partnership with the federal government and the TTC to purchase 60 new streetcars in May, will maintain, according to the president of Alstom, 400 good manufacturing jobs at the facility. Speaker, this PC government will always have the back of hardworking Northern Ontarians. After years of neglect by the previous Liberal government, we are supporting good local Spons? jobs and ensuring that Metrolinx has the fleet required to support GO expansion across our rail network. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. The uh, supplementary question. Thank you very much. Uh Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for her response and her hard work to help Northern Ontario. This is great news for Northwestern Ontario and GO expansion, and I understand the Minister is also leading work that will benefit the Northeast. Following the Liberals' irresponsible decision to abandon passenger rail, many in the area are desperate for change and are looking to our government for support. So, Speaker, to the Minister of Transportation, through you, what is the Minister doing to right the wrongs of the previous Liberal government and bring back passenger rail to the north. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. As the member rightfully put, the Del Duca Liberals let down the people of the north when they abruptly cancelled passenger rail service. Last year, our government invested $5 million into the necessary track audit to bring passenger service rail back. In this year's fall economic statement, we announced that the terminus station for the Northlander will be in Timmins, one of the largest hubs in the north. And two weeks ago, the ONTC ran the first passenger rail test train from North Bay to Toronto. This is a huge step towards completing the updated business case for the project and making this return to service a reality. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased that our work to get passenger rail, train, rail back on track is being so well received. We made a promise to the people of Northern Thoughts? Ontario, and our government is keeping that promise. Next question. The member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, Alexandra Lind lives just a two-minute walk from Sir Arthur Curry Public School, a school in my riding built four years ago that now has 22 portables on site. Chronic overcrowding means that when Alexandra's 18-month-old daughter starts JK, she will very likely be bussed out of the neighbourhood to a school on the other side of the city. Alexandra told me to say I am panicking would be an understatement. Speaker, when a new school opens in their neighbourhood, surely the students who live in that neighbourhood deserve to be able to attend. Will this government confirm today that the funding requested by the Thames Valley District School Board will be approved? for the new schools that London families urgently need. To reply, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I recognize there is fast growth in London, specifically. I've spoken to the member, uh, uh, MPP Jeff Urich, as well, about this issue, and the mayor, Mayor Holder, uh, some months ago about the growth. I can commit that we will continue to invest in capital improvements in new schools and expansions in London, specifically in this round of the capital approvals, which will be unveiled in short order. We've invested roughly uh, roughly uh, $14 billion over 10 years. Uh, this year alone, we announced, in conjunction with the Minister, in partnership with the Minister of Infrastructure, uh, renewal and an expansion of 26 new schools, 20 permanent additions, and over 3,000 affordable and accessible childcare spaces within our publicly funded schools. I know there's more to do in London and across Ontario, and the Premier and our government is committed to getting the job done. Supplementary question. 
Speaker, Sir Arthur Curry Public School was at capacity almost the day it opened four years ago. Now the school is bursting at the seams with double the number of students it was built for. In fact, the Thames Valley District School Board is planning for two new schools to accommodate northwest London population growth. Karis Martin has one child at Sir Arthur Curry School and another at the child care and is concerned about their safety and learning. She says that government funding for schools that are too small from the start is, quote, short-sighted, fiscally irresponsible, and would end careers in any other industry. Speaker, will this government commit to new school funding that will accommodate both current and projected capacity in rapidly growing Northwest London? Mr. Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We can absolutely commit to continue to invest in new schools and expansion of schools in the region of London, in, in the city of London. We know how important it is for children to have access to safe, ex local, uh, quality uh, educational facilities within their communities, and that's exactly why we've invested over half a billion dollars on an annual basis to build net new schools. In sharp contrast to the 600 schools closed under the former Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, it's not just the closure of schools, it's the, the, the actual standard and the maintenance of those schools. When we came to power and we were given the privilege to serve, roughly $15.9 billion in a repaired backlog. $16 billion in our schools that should have been done under the former Liberal government that wasn't. But our Premier is investing $1.3 billion on an annual basis to bring down that backlog, and we're spending and investing with the Minister of Infrastructure, our Premier, and our entire government to make sure children and families in London get the schools that they deserve. Thank you. The next question, the member for York Centre. Good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Six weeks ago, the science table suggested that Ontario should pass a mandate for health care workers. The government pretended that it opposed mandates, but with very few exceptions, Ontario's hospitals imposed their own mandates, resulting in the suspension and termination of thousands of health care workers. Three days ago, the science table issued a report saying that new restrictions may now be required because of staffing shortages. Not only did the government fail to stand in the way of suspension and termination of thousands of health care workers, it's utterly incapable of growing the number of Ontario's hospital nurses to meet demand. My question to the Minister of Health is a math question. I'm asking for a number, not for talking points. How many net new nurses have been added to Ontario's hospital roles since March 2020? Or did the number of total nurses working in Ontario's hospitals actually decrease? Is it more nurses? Is it less nurses? Question. And how many? Government House Leader. As we had said right from the beginning, we thought uh, it would be important for uh, uh, local health care uh, authorities to, uh, to make those decisions based on uh, the needs in, uh, in their community, Mr. Speaker. That is why we made the decision we did with respect to uh, uh, vaccine mandates uh, uh, across the province of Ontario and our health care system. Supplementary question. Speaker, it's remarkable that I asked a question about how many net new nurses have been added or lost since the pandemic, and the Minister of Health would not take my question. It was the government house leader that just took a question about the amount of net new nurses. So maybe the minister would like to take that in supplementary. Speaker, uh -huh. a week ago, the head of the science table was talking about Canada's reassessment of the way the virus transmits. Contrary to what we were told for the last 20 months, transmission of the virus is not droplet, it's aerosol. Of course, that was known since early uh, summer 2020. The head of the science table therefore said that plexiglass does more harm than good because it disrupts ventilation. The minister always said that they're listening to the science. Last week, she responded to this question by saying that she's listening to the chief medical officer. Well, then maybe she and the science table and the chief medical officer can have a Zoom call to discuss plexiglass. Why won't the minister listen to the head of the science table, acknowledge that question. plexiglass is harmful, and recommend that businesses and school boards do away with plexiglass? Government House Leader. Uh, yeah, the member will recall on a Zoom call that we had uh, in uh, January, a second uh, Zoom call that we had in February, and one in March, and, and in April, and May, and June, and July, and August, September, the multiple calls that we had, which facilitated uh, a number of the decisions that this government made with respect to the measures that he voted in favor of from the beginning of the pandemic to the time he decided he wanted to change his mind. The things that he's talking about, he actually voted in favor of, Mr. Speaker. He voted in favor of, uh, of, uh, of the closure. Order. He voted. Order. He, he, Member for York Centre will come to order. Government House Leader will conclude his answer. 
I, I suspect, I know I hear the member shouting that that's why he's not sitting here. I suspect his behavior is why he's not sitting here <laughs> and not uh, his, uh, his true belief in the policies that he voted for time and time and time again, Mr. Speaker. And the next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. It's no surprise that over a decade of poor policy choices has led to the affordability crisis that we're experiencing today. In Kitchener Centre, food bank usage has increased by 26 per cent. Those experiencing being unhoused has more than tripled in three years, and one of our shelters, the House of Friendship, had to close temporarily while they look for space that they can afford. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Premier. Can the Premier please tell the people of Kitchener Centre what he is doing to ensure that all of our neighbours are housed, have access to healthy food, and have a sustainable living wage so our communities can recover equitably? Mr. Kniaz, please call. Thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, to the member opposite for that very important question. And, uh, you know, affordability across the province is an issue, uh, not just here in Ontario, across the country. Uh, food insecurity, rising prices, uh, Housing shortages are all issues that we take uh, very seriously, and that's why, Mr. Speaker, that we've taken certain actions to, to uh, make life more affordable for Ontarians, uh, not least of which is working on the housing uh, supply side of the equation, making sure that uh, we take actions. More rental uh, purpose-built houses were built uh, last year since 1992, working on uh, the lowest income and people hurt the most in terms of wages, the minimum wage, 760,000 people during a pandemic got a pay raise. Mr. Speaker, uh, we'll continue to take action, and I appreciate the question from the uh, member opposite. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. People in my community are struggling. It's near impossible to find safe and supportive housing and it's near impossible to get by on ODSP or Ontario Works. Yesterday's Auditor General's report stated, and I quote, ministry funding is outdated and based on old modelling. My constituents deserve a government that puts their needs first in every policy decision that's being made. So through you, Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier, will this government commit today to increase and properly fund OW and ODSP so that people can finally stop being forced to beg this government simply to survive? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Speaker, and I, I just want to reiterate the importance that our government has uh, focused on to getting vital services to our most vulnerable people and delivering on those services. When we look back uh, at ODSP and OW during this pandemic, uh, they are application-based. Uh, because of the supports that were being put out by the federal government, we saw a drop in applications to our programs. However, uh, we are starting to see an uptick now. We understand the importance of, of providing the services. We, we have uh, brought in 8.3, over $8.3 billion on an annual basis and increasing to provide this, these services. We have increased the rate for OW and ODSP. Um, and, and we are for Ottawa, putting out a billion Senator dollars Kendorter. of social services relief funding. Uh, that has been done. So we are continuing to put out the dollars to support these uh, vulnerable programs, the Spons. vulnerable people in these programs, and we will continue uh, to, to make sure that the accessibility to these programs is available. Thank you. Next question, the member for Scarborough Gilder. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Speaker, yesterday I tabled my private member's bill, the Safe and Healthy Communities Act, addressing gun violence. This bill will amend the Health Insurance Act, allowing insured services to include prescribed hospital and community-based violence inter intervention programs. This change will also allow trauma-informed counselling for victims and their families affected by gun violence through OHIP. Gun violence is a public health crisis, a crisis that leaves trauma ripping through families and communities and causes intergenerational pain. This year, in the midst of COVID, we have had the worst incidences of homicides in Ontario due to gun violence. In October alone, there have been 11 homicides, all of Question. which are devastating to families and to people. Bill 60, Speaker, is about healing that trauma by providing a public health lens and approach to the trauma that is caused. So I'm asking this minister, will you support this bill 
by incorporating it into the work that you're doing right now. Government House Leader. Mr. I appreciate the question. Uh, the member will know how seriously this, uh, this side of the House takes uh, uh, private members' business. Uh, we will, uh, of course, endeavour to, uh, uh, to review uh, that bill like we do every, uh, every bill, Mr. Speaker. But at the same time, the, uh, the, uh, the issue with guns and gangs is, is, is really a, a, a very important one that, uh, that uh, we have struggled with for a very long time. I know the government is making, the Solicitor General and the Premier are making significant investments in uh, guns and gangs, I think over $180 million to, to tackle this. Uh, uh, this, Mr. Speaker, but it's, it's, it is a multi-faceted uh, uh, approach. It has to include uh, not only uh, interventions on the ground with supports for our police, it has to include uh, increased security at our borders. It does have to include community services and the work that the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions is doing, the work that the Minister of Municipal Affairs and, and Housing uh, is doing to ensure that there is a continuum of, of care and outreach, Mr. Speaker. So I do appreciate uh, uh, the member's question, but as I said, we'll take a look uh, and endeavour to review the bill. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, back to the Minister of Health. This is not a problem that you can arrest your way out of. The former police chief of Toronto, Mark Saunders, said that, and I quote, Speaker, our communities are hurting. In my riding of Scarborough-Guildwood, there were eight shootings in the month of November. Eight shootings. Last night, I attended a roundtable in Scarborough with many mothers and members of my community who have been affected directly. They have lost their loved ones. Evelyn lost her son to gun violence. Tamisha lost her brother. And what they're looking for, Speaker, is not just one half of the solution in which um, the government just talked about. They're looking for a whole community solution and approach. A public health lens will allow the issue at its root to be healed and that Question. intergenerational trauma that is affecting the communities to be resolved. We know that we can't just rely on hospitals to stitch people up and put them back in the very same environment in which the injury occurred. So, Speaker, my question to this government, will they work with public health officials to create a community-based response to gun violence now? Well, I, I, I agree, Mr. Speaker. That's why the, uh, uh, the, the task force and, the, and the, uh, the significant funding that we put in place is, uh, is a three-pronged pro approach for prevention, uh, intervention, and enforcement. I think the member would agree that all three pillars are very important if we're going to, uh, to tackle this once and for all, Mr. Speaker. But it is also important to recognize that a number of these guns are illegal guns which are making their way across the border. So we have to include that if we're talking about this. We have to include community services. I know that the Boys and Girls Club uh, uh, in her community does some very good, re good work on outreach and early intervention, Mr. Speaker. It is a leading organization when it comes to outreach in her community. I'm very familiar with the Scarborough Guildwood uh, area and all of the important community services that are going on there. That's why we're making significant investments, uh, Speaker. But I do appreciate that the honourable member, the, the focus Response. of uh, the honourable member's uh, question. But as I said, we'll take a look at her, her private members' bill. A historic number of PMBs have passed under uh, under this government, and if it's a good Bill, of course, will pass it. The next question, the member for Hamilton West and Pastor Dundas. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Yesterday's Auditor General report raises serious questions about land use planning in Ontario. In Hamilton, our City Council just voted overwhelmingly to reject this government's costly sprawl agenda concerned with loss of farmland and a worsening climate crisis. The minister has used heavy-handed tactics to short-circuit democratic processes, including writing an unprecedented op-ed in The Spectator. Hamiltonians were aghast. Former PC cabinet minister and now Hamilton City Councillor Brad Clark said of this minister he should stop meddling in Hamilton politics. Given this government's clear bias in favour of land speculators, I have to ask, will this minister reject respect? the democratic decision of Hamiltonians to meet our housing demand and protect our farmland. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, thanks, Speaker. Um, uh, speaker, young families, seniors, hardworking Hamiltonians need to have an affordable place to call home. Ontario is in a housing crisis. Driven by a severe shortage of supply, we've asked our municipal partners uh, to look at their official plans and plan for growth. As 
all members of the House will know. Many, many months ago, we sent a clear signal to municipalities. We wanted them to get their official plans done on time, and we wanted them to project uh, and forecast over the next 30 years what they're going to need in terms of housing affordability. Regardless of that exercise, Speaker, regardless of the fact that we want councils like the City of Hamilton to look long range on what they're going to need, we're in a housing crisis right now. Housing is unaffordable Question, for too many Ontarians, and we need our municipal partners to do what they can to help us. Speaker. Here, here. Supplementary question. Speaker, there's nothing that this minister has done that will guarantee that any of these homes will be affordable. Absolutely nothing. So it's hard to trust what we hear from this minister. And frankly, my constituents have had enough of the bullying coming from this from Queen's Park. Responding to this minister's inappropriate meddling, Hamilton's mayor stated, I don't care what the minister says. A survey of Hamiltonians showed that almost 95 per cent of all responded, respondents wanted to protect our farmland. Hamilton has sent a clear message. Yet this minister has a track record of running over local democracy. The Auditor General said as much regarding this minister's frivolous use of MZOs to benefit the Premier's developer buddies. So I ask again, will you respect Hamiltonians' democratic decision? Order. Minister of Municipal Affairs to respond. No, has, uh, has spoken again. Um, <laughs> economic, so if, if the member doesn't want to take my word for it, let's, let's look at some of the other experts. Economic consultant Frank Clayton, co-founder of Ryerson University's Centre for Urban Research and Land Development, warns that Hamilton will fail to produce enough detached single-family homes to meet market demand and that buyers will end up finding real estate booms in places farther afield, such as Woodstock or Brantford. Let's be clear on the facts. Hamilton is forecasted to grow by over 236,000 people by 2051. Order. Hamilton's existing urban boundary does not have enough land to support the 60,000 new single-family homes that the city's own land needs assessment says it's the city's oh, own planners God. who have told council oh, that this is God. what they need, Speaker. All options good? are on the table, Speaker. We're going to work with our municipal partners. We're going to continue. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, call the Minister of Government and Consumer Services to order and the member for Hamilton West Ancaster Dundas to come to order. Point of order, member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I seek unanimous consent from this House to pass Bill 60. The um, government House leader has said that the contents of the bill um, warranting that, that he would support that. So I seek unanimous consent to pass Bill 60. The Save the Health Communities Act, uh, addressing gun violence, uh, gun violence, a public health issue in this province, and to end uh, the devastation that is happening to communities as a result of this issue. Just a sec. Point of order? Same point. Uh, speaker, uh, I think if the member uh, goes back and answers, she'll see that I said that we will take a look at the bill, we will review it, and if it is a good bill, then we would uh, pass the bill. Uh, speaker, we haven't had a chance to do a fulsome review. I think she just introduced it yesterday. I don't believe the bill has even been printed at this point. Uh, speaker, and as the member will know, we do not unanimously pass. It's been my practice not to unanimously pass bills in one stage at any point. They have to go to committee and they have to have a proper sound. Thank you. Okay. Member for Scarborough Guildwood is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to immediately pass <coughs> Bill 60. Agreed? No. Heard some notes. Question period has concluded. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for York Centre has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Government House Leader concerning the number of net new nurses. This matter will be debated Tuesday following private members' public business. We now have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on the motion for third reading of Bill 13, an act to amend various acts. On November 30, 2021, Ms. Mrs. Tangri moved third reading of Bill 13, an act to amend various acts. On December 1, 2021, Mr. Miller, Perry Sound Muskoka, moved that the question be now put. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes on Mr. Miller, Perry Sound Muskoka's motion that the question be now put. I'll ask the clerks to please prepare the lobbies. <laughs>